Today's date is November 1st, 2010, and we are here at Cobra Electronics to interview Bernard Krieger at his office on behalf of the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. Good morning, Bernie. Good morning. And Robert. I want to thank you for agreeing to do this interview. Bernie, you were born two months before the great stock market crash. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I didn't look at it that way, but <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to do with the crash, though. Right. No. <laughs> now, your parents were immigrants. And yes. how long were they here before you were born? They were here about uh, nine years, eight, nine years. Uh -huh. And where did they come from? My father came from East Prussia, which is now Poland. My mother came from Romania. And how did they meet? Uh, they met in, in the Bronx, right? Nice. They were both immigrants uh -huh. struggling in, uh, in the Depression and uh, uh, <clears throat> trying to meet people. and. It's funny, I really don't know, but my mother told me she would, uh, that my dad would hang out around the barber shop, uh -huh. and she'd go there to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of work did your father do? <clears throat> my father was a, uh, a jeweler, and he had a wholesale jewelry uh, establishment where he sold tools and findings on 47th Street in New York. Now, had he also done that in Europe? He learned in Europe, mm -hmm. in Belgium, when he um, <clears throat> uh, he left home during the First World War. He was uh, being evacuated because the, the the Russians were moving Jews out of a certain village. He was uh, about 14, 15 years old. What year was that? <clears throat> I don't know. Mm -hmm. Middle of the First World War, and he was in a column of people, and he got he got lost from his parents, and um, he spent about a year and a half or so. Uh, someone else raised him, and then he was raised by a relative, and finally he went on his own at about fifteen years old. Traveled to through Europe, wanted to come to the U.S. The war was just ending at that time. And he um, got to um, Antwerp, Belgium, and he learned to trade as a jeweler. And he made some friends there. And Hyas was a Jewish uh, organization that would help people move to the United States. And they moved him to the United States, and he came here through Ellis Island, and um, and uh, got a job pretty fast. He was very aggressive at that time. And, and there it was. He formed a pretty good business and, and he grew his family mm -hmm. in the Bronx and worked there till he retired. Oh my, that's yeah. a wonderful story. Well, Did he, um, was he ever reunited with his parents? No. <clears throat> no. He wasn't. Um, they were um, his parents were moved into a square when the Nazis came in and they were all shot. One niece of his, his brother's daughter, uh, went to Israel just before the war. Believe it or not, I found her in recent years. I didn't even know she existed. I wonder if so, she's yeah, and um, her mother and father just came to visit me. They left yesterday and they went back to Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you find her? Oh, it's very funny. <clears throat> my mother was alive. My mother lived till 98 years old, so she was quite a, uh, quite a woman. And uh, I had to make a trip because I sell microwave systems. We were making an installation in Israel. And I told my mom I'm going to Israel for the first time. This was maybe 10 years ago. She says, oh, if you go, 
why don't you look up the people that your father would, had written to? I said, I didn't know he wrote to anybody. He says, yes, there's a letter. I'll find a letter for you. She gave me a letter. It was 1950-something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. And all I had was the second name, Freiburg, but no first name. And she, did, she gave the names of her sons. <clears throat> and when I was in a rubber factory in Israel, I asked, how do I find someone by the name of Freiburg? So uh, they had a computer printout. We saw all the Freibergs there. And we started calling. Susan was with me. Right? Mm -hmm. So Susan was calling. She knew the names of the sons. She says, do you have someone by the name of Chaim and Yitzhak and, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody. Mm -hmm. But so, a lot of them were just voicemail messages. So two days before going back home, the phone rang where we were and said, are you looking for me? We found her. Oh, her name was Hannah. Oh, my. The maiden name was Hannah Krieger. And uh, was my delight to see her. Isn't she was funny? so happy when I looked at her. She looked like my father. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That brings that was tears great. to my eyes. Wasn't it? Me yes, too. Yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Right. Wow. And they were just here visiting. They were just the, right. Her parents, uh, her uh, children, children were visiting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Children are. Uh, her son is a lawyer. Was a colonel in the army. Israeli army for a long time. Well, thank you for telling us that. Well, That's really Well, wonderful. you asked the question. So. Yes. <laughs> now, you grew up and went to school in the Bronx. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, what, did you experience any anti-Semitism growing up in the Bronx? In school? Or? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I did. It just, uh, it just was part of being Jewish. Mm -hmm. Get, get beat up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I wish I was stronger. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go to high school? I went to Dewitt Clinton High School mm -hmm. uh, in the Bronx. And um, it was an old boys school. Mm -hmm. yeah, good school. Pretty rough school, but a good school. And then you went to NYU? And then I went to NYU. I went to NYU uptown. Uh, had a nice campus there. Also, all boys, mm -hmm. all male at that time. So I didn't uh, know what girls were, but if I later found out it was very okay. interesting. <laughs> How did you meet your first wife, Deborah? Uh, I met Deborah at a, I was riding a horse at a, at a ranch, and, um, and, and, and she was on a horse. And I think she had fallen off, and I saw her walking on the trail. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, and I said something stupid. <laughs> and she just walked away in a huff. Uh -huh. And I saw her later that evening. And uh, wonderful woman. Yeah. That's wonderful. Wonderful woman. I, that's, I would say, if you ask me my strengths, I pick good wives. Yes. Well, I just I know right? Susan. And Susan is just super duper. Yes. Right. And you were lucky enough to have two wives who were excellent right. cooks, I understand. Yes, excellent cooks. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent in uh, handcrafts, both skilled as teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, after uh, NYU, you went where? I went into the Army. You want to tell us about your army career? Yeah, well, I, liked it. I liked it. It was during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I, I would say the highlight of my experience that I really liked, I was a company commander of troops. And um, I enjoyed that. It was spirited, although I was very young. Well, almost all my soldiers were older than me. <clears throat> um, but that was part of it. And I spent, um, I spent uh, <clears throat> about a year in the United States studying advanced electronics. And that sort of put me into my career. The rest of the time I was at the Far East Command, uh, spending time at, a, uh, at an ordnance depot in Tokyo, which was 
pretty good. Although when I got there, when we were in the occupation army, the Japanese were just, uh, <clears throat> the, the war had been over for a few years, five years or so. The occupation was ending, but when I got there, it was the occupation army. <clears throat> then, then I was supposed to uh, go on to um, Korea, where it was cold as hell. And uh, my soldiers took good care of me. They gave me a footlocker full of warm clothes because <laughs> everyone was shivering over there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's an interesting story. And um, since I was in Tokyo, I knew the area there. I was a replacement depot. I was leaving. <clears throat> I had um, reported to my commanding officer that I'm going to uh, headquarters in, in Korea for further assignment. And um, I went to a replacement depot where you wait for your aircraft or ship to take you, and you can wait and wait and wait. And they assigned you, they gave me a weapon, a carbine, um, and I sighted it in so that it was accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and that night I went to the officers club in, in Tokyo because I had been there for some months and I knew it. And I was sitting at, at a bar there with a, with a colonel and we started talking. And he, he, <clears throat> he said, um, what's your background? What are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm waiting for my ship to take me over. He said, uh, tell me about what you did in the Army. I said, well, I studied advanced electronics at Aberdeen Proving Ground related to weapons. He says, you know something? <clears throat> We need someone like that on Okinawa. <laughs> wow. uh, he said, uh, why, don't, uh, why don't you talk to me a little while we talk. The next morning, I got called. <clears throat> and I got on the aircraft, and I ended up in Okinawa. 125 degrees with a footlocker full of winter clothing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Um, I understand that. But no bullet holes in it. Okay. So. <laughs> that, that's pretty standard, though, for the Army, isn't, isn't it? Pretty standard. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, did you, what did you actually do there in Okinawa? Uh, over there, <coughs> I, uh, I was in charge of a uh, maintenance shop mm -hmm. for all weapons. Mm -hmm. And we had an advanced type of uh, radar with the anti-aircraft anti facilities because we were protecting Kadena Air Base from which uh, the Air Force was bombing the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. So we had we were prepared to protect that. And the North Koreans had some pretty good fighter aircraft too. And so the radar is what they really wanted me for and I was on a team that went around and we checked out the radar, we fired mm -hmm. a lot, yeah, and the, um, <clears throat> the noise was absolutely deafening from 90, 120 millimeter guns, oh my goodness. yeah, it was deafening, and I have a disability in my, in my ears mm -hmm. from that. Well, I can understand that. Oh, yeah. Did you, when you were in Japan, did you experience any um, anti-Semitism in Japan? No. No. No, I think everything was fine. I was surprised because the Japanese were so fanatic during the Second World War. They were extremely friendly. Mm -hmm. The whole culture was changing right. when the Americans came in. The Emperor was still there, but the culture was, was changing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> MacArthur was at his headquarters and um, right across from the Imperial Palace. Mm -hmm. Right. And he really had a heavy hand on that, uh, when I say heavy, constructive hand. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he took the Japanese uh, system of business, which was called the Zaibatsu, seven powerful families controlled everything, and he broke all of that up, made it more democratic, mm -hmm. and Japan grew. Yes. Right. Really grew. They're struggling a little now, but they are very fine. <clears throat> creative people. Mm -hmm. I have many friends in Japan, not from that, but in my later work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Now, 
you spent 14 years in the Far East, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no. <clears throat> I was 14 years <clears throat> involved either on active duty or in the, in the reserves. Mm -hmm. But I only spent uh, t two years there. Oh, I see. Bernie, before I go and ask you questions about how you came to um, Stanford, to Stanford, I'd like to, you to tell us a little bit about uh, the people who influenced you. And you talk about uh, some uncles who I had an influence. uncle that it, it, yes, I really admired him when I was a kid. And, uh, <coughs> he, uh, his name was Joe, Uncle Joe. And he was my mother's sister's husband. Okay. <clears throat> and he just was a real fine man, bright. He was, uh, I think he was a union steward for a, uh, for Canada Dry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he uh, went overseas during the Second World War. I missed it. He, um, he got uh, wounded in the Battle of Bulge, got a couple of bullets through his th thigh. <clears throat> he uh, won the Silver Star for bravery. Oh, my. Yeah. And he came back and, yeah, came back and it was a happy relationship. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You spent a good deal of time with him. Well, when I was very young, we lived in the same building. And, that's wonderful. Right. And, and there were some other uncles and, and some aunts, too? Uncles and aunts, right. I remember with my Uncle Joe, <clears throat> the, uh, my aunt wasn't home and a telegram came in which said that your uh, husband, Joseph so-and-so, was seriously wounded in, in action uh, at, in the uh, Ardennes, I think. And. Um, I showed it to my mom, and she didn't like the word seriously. <laughs> so she says the one that sends the telegrams out was a lady that was living across the street. Uh -huh. They communicated, and she made the telegrams. I went back there, and uh, after much pleading, got the word seriously deleted. <laughs> and, uh, and they gave it to my aunt, and that was bad enough. Right. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great story. Okay. So they all live relatively close, either we in live, the same the building. The family lives sort of here. close, right? That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, the family was close. We had, uh, we would have Jewish holidays together and things like that. It was really nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I think that's what is lacking today. Kids don't have that extended family. Mm -hmm. Now, Bernie, right. after you got out of the army, mm -hmm. what did you do? <clears throat> After I got out of the army, I had studied uh, economics mm -hmm. <clears throat> for my undergraduate work. <clears throat> After I got out of the army, I needed a job, and I started, I was interviewing, and they said, "What's your experience?" I said, "Well, I know rifles, pistols, radar." artillery <laughs> and mortars and anything like that. Uh -huh. Well, we don't need that. Okay. <laughs> so I said, well, if people don't need that, what am I going to do? Uh, I can't start off as an economist always. <laughs> so I said, well, where do people need that? I went to an army arsenal in Philadelphia. And they said, boy, you know everything we do. <clears throat> and I got a job as a um, a civilian employee there at Frankfurt Arsenal of Philadelphia, and I moved to Philadelphia. Okay. Were you married then? No. Okay. No, not long before I was married. I didn't get married. In those days, I was old when I got married. I was 30 years old. Oh, my Nowadays, I'm right. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Now, when you were in, in Pennsylvania, you and, also went to Temple University? I went to Temple University. I started... Uh, going for my MBA there. Mm -hmm. I wanted an MBA. Mm -hmm. right. So I worked at the arsenal, mm -hmm. and boy, that was moving too slow, slowly for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a year, a little more, I'm not sure, 
I started dealing with uh, uh, issuing government contracts. I got involved in contract negotiations on behalf of the government and, and programs like that. And uh, I eventually took a job with a contractor in the electronics field, military electronics. It was called Lewitt Corporation. They also made vacuum cleaners. And they were in, um, in uh, Williamsburg, mm -hmm. Williamsburg section of, of Brooklyn. And I spent quite a few years there. Okay. Yeah. And from there you went from, where? From there I saw an ad in the paper. I lived, I moved, I did get married at 30. <clears throat> I moved to Long Island, although I was there only a short time. And I uh, wanted to grow more, and I was not growing fast enough there. And I saw an ad for a company called Manson Laboratories. Mm -hmm. Three very bright Jewish engineers had formed that company in Stanford. Uh, Jonas Shapiro, uh, Herb Feldman, I don't know if you ever knew Vivian Feldman, probably not. And uh, Sandy Jacobson. Mm -hmm. And I started working for them as the marketing manager. And we really grew that company significantly. And that company got bought out by a bigger company in, um, in, in Detroit. Uh, no, in Chicago. <clears throat> in Chicago. The uh, company was called Hallicrafters Corporation. And uh, Hallicrafters was making radios, radio sets, and we were making military radio sets. So it was very compatible, and they bought the company. And usually when you buy companies, things change. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the divisions of our company was a microwave division, which uh, was the smaller end. The new parent was not that interested in that company, and they said, <clears throat> in the microwave end, and for economic reasons, they wanted to move the whole company uh, out to Chicago. Nobody yeah. wanted to go. Now, what year was that? That was in um, 1965. Okay, and microwaves yes. were... Microwaves were then. used only in radar, or just starting to get used and for, for the idea for home cooking, but it was very innovative at that time and very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so... <clears throat> we came up with an idea, one of the partners, Sandy Jacobson and myself, we came up with an idea. Let's buy the microwave division because the parent was not interested. <clears throat> and I bought it together with him using his money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I eventually paid him back. And we started our company. We, and, uh, we called it Cobra Electronics. Cobra comes from... C-O-B comes from J. Cubs, uh -huh. and the B-E-R is from Bernard. Nice. And here we are. We started with, uh, with military types of radar. And over the years, I said, well, industrial usage of microwaves uh, could make the U.S. much more productive. So I started changing our focus, and that would be were one of the pioneers in developing microwave technology for industrial use. Can you explain to us how... How, how it works? Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and what <coughs> the application is today. <coughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, in producing materials, no matter what it is, heat is always a process, ovens and heat, uh, very consumptive of energy and very slow. <clears throat> so microwaves are a means of electronic heating. It's not heat, but it's energy transfer. Mm -hmm. So the ovens don't get hot, but the microwaves uh, will heat the material that's in the oven. <clears throat> and the material, the nature of the material, 
will create heat within itself. From these microwaves, which are cold, mm -hmm. and in the air someplace, <clears throat> the material takes that, absorbs it, and creates heat within itself. Okay. Now you've got, a, you're drinking, Barbara, a cup of, of water there. Mm -hmm. If you put the cup in empty, the cup is not going to get hot. Its nature is it doesn't absorb microwave energy. Mm -hmm. You put the water in and turn on the microwaves, it'll boil. So, so therefore we looked for materials that were receptive to microwave energy. And these materials, uh, which, which I focused on, were at first rubber, because rubber uh, gets very hot in the microwave oven. And we developed a business in uh, heating rubber for the automotive industry. How we do still they, do that. How did the automotive industry use the rubber? Main, the main usage was through, that's interesting, was through extrusions. Now extrusion is, um, the rubber comes in as a mass. Take your mother's meat grinder, okay, right? right? She takes a big glob of meat, mm -hmm. puts it in the top, turns the handle, right. and out comes these strands like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. I still have her grinder. <laughs> <laughs> you do? Okay. Now, <clears throat> rubber uh, is very important in an automobile because the rubber goes around the door and the window, mm -hmm. and what people want is when you close the door, they want to hear click like a Mercedes. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, good car. <clears throat> and when they drive in the car, they don't want to hear wind noise. That all is the rubber. So rubber, the quality of rubber is a big element in determining people's preference. And this rubber goes into a die that shapes it <clears throat> like the part that goes on the car. I'll show you some signals. I know I'm going out of your camera, but that's I'll bring it up. Say parts like this uh -huh. would go uh, into an automobile and it would hold the window and it gets extruded from that grinder. Uh -huh. It goes into the microwave at high speed. The microwave is a conveyor and it uh, gets heated and comes out completed on the end. Uh, and um, that that's a major part of our business. Mm -hmm. wow. The our biggest customers in the beginning was was believe it or not Toyota who built plants here in North America. Oh my! Yeah. Now, do you have any competitors in this industry? Grr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes, we do, and mostly foreign, mm -hmm. German heavy competitors, German machines. Mm -hmm. Now, this was basically, though, your brainchild, was it not? Well, I, I saw it being done on a laboratory basis and just experiments, and, and we developed it further. Mm -hmm. And then we commercialized it. Uh, one of the shortcomings was that, I remember, Barbara, I said it, it, it depends on the material. The water boiled, the cup didn't. Right. And I didn't know rubber. Mm -hmm. So, in order to know rubber, you got to know rubber chemistry and how it's compounded and mixed because some rubber heats and some doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, I made an alliance with Uniroyal Chemical Company, who was in Connecticut, in Naugatuck, and they did the chemistry and we did the machines and they helped us sell and that got us going in that area. Now, this, this is something that cannot be patented, can it? Uh, well, it's. It's, I, we're not aggressive in patents. Mm -hmm. Certain devices in there could be patented, but the idea of heating something is generally known. So at that point you were now living in Stanford, am I correct? I was living in Stanford, right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. I lived first uh, in a uh, two-family house. I had rented the upstairs and then moved to um, Riverbank Road where I had a small house with my wife and my son was born there 
and then I bought a bigger house mm -hmm. on Westover Road. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely house. It's a lovely house. Yes, it really is. is. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. And you became very involved in the Stanford community. Yes. You want to yes. tell us about that? Well, <clears throat> I coming from the Bronx, mm -hmm. I didn't see much community. We had our own family. And in Stanford, it was different. There was a Jewish population. And I was not involved in the synagogue or, or, or anything like that. I guess I became bar mitzvah in the Bronx, but uh, <clears throat> I, I had a feeling for Jewish community. I wanted to grow that. And I got involved in the Jewish Center. Now I had a, uh, a little boy go to Sarah's nursery school <laughs> and I said boy this is wonderful Jewish community was wonderful and I want to do something to grow it mm -hmm. and uh, although Jewish the Jewish Center on uh, well I forgot the street or Cosmic Street was going downhill they made me president I was elected president mm -hmm. And it was an interesting challenge. And I saw that most of the population was uh, looked for culture and exercise and whatever in New York City. Mm -hmm. And the old Jewish center was just not appropriate for the style of the, of the people that were living in Stanford. So I said to my team, we've got to get out of here. And we searched and we found this uh, wonderful property on Newfield Avenue. It had a few houses on it. Uh, Nicilius was the owner. He owned, a, he owned a, a casting plant in Stanford. He was very sick. And we negotiated and negotiated and we got that at a pretty good price. I forgot what it was, $125,000 something like that. Oh my goodness, 15, what year was that? 13 acres. That was about uh, 1970. You haven't heard the whole story. We couldn't get in there. We had zoning problems. We were dis disapproved by the zoning board. <clears throat> uh, they didn't want a Jewish center there. So uh, this was in 19, I would say, 73, 74. Mm -hmm. And then we had a fight on our hands, unfortunately, with the neighbors. Uh, all sorts of things going on. We were turned down by the zoning board. We were turned down by the zoning board of appeals. And then, God bless one lawyer in Stanford, Leo Gold. You know Leo? I do. Leo was the president before me. Uh huh. Okay. I said, Leo, you got to help us. <laughs> and he took it to the Supreme Court, we had a Jewish center. Oh my goodness. Yeah, wow. we did it. And how long did that whole process take? Oh, that took a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I was no longer president when, when the new center was born. Mm -hmm. Then they started a center without walls. <laughs> and, and just people getting together in the old building, the old where Nicilius had lived. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the community grew. So very good leaders. Al Kamai, I don't know if you knew him. Yeah. Very fine person. Very good people. I just know it from the last 20 years. From the last 20 years. Yes. Herb Gladstone mm -hmm. was my vice, vice president. He took a major part in negotiating and, and uh, buying that property. Do you know her? Yeah, very well. <laughs> so. Now, the original building um, right. of the JCC, it's still standing, am I correct? No. No. No, the building was not torn down. It's a new building. No, 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 I mean time. the one on Prospect Street. Oh, that's there. That's, that's, that's the Chabad now. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That's still standing. Right, that's what I thought. Yeah. Now, do you feel that the um, board was anti-Semitic in denying you permits to build? 
they were, I don't want to put it that way, that, <clears throat> but uh, they said that that uh, Newfield Avenue was too crowded and there is no place for a religious institution like that. <laughs> it was so many, they were just wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and they had to respond to the neighbors, and the neighbors didn't, didn't want a Jewish community center there. Mm -hmm. now, but the in the end, it worked out fine. Were the churches there at that time? The church, time? of course, were there. Yes. The Italian center was there. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Italian, yes. The center further down further the road down was there. Yeah. So there was, it's, it's an avenue of churches. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. You also became involved in the Chavara. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you want to tell us about that? <clears throat> I like the Havara very, very much. The Rabbi Mark Allen is a sensational person. Um, I really learned so much about Judaism then in my later life. Let's see, you're a little tilted with that. You know, the camera seems to be a little tilted. I could go like this if you want to <laughs> <I> look straight. <laughs> The, uh, I got involved with the Havara. <coughs> I was with Mark and I learned so much mm -hmm. of the Jewish values and I really, I really enjoy that. And my wife Susan is very involved and friendly with all the women there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, after your first <coughs> wife died, yes. you met Susan. I met Susan. Mark Olive, our rabbi, introduced me to her. That's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. It was just wonderful. I, in addition to be in, being the CEO of Cobra Electronics, I had started about 15 years ago a specialized scientific society group of people we call the Microwave Working Group. I'm still president of that group. And we are putting on a world congress in microwave technology in California in 2012. I'm working on that. Now. That's very exciting. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Now, how many people are involved in what? the same business? And what we did is we, in Japan, China, Europe, and the U.S., there are microwave societies. Uh, my group gets them all together for these big events. Oh my. Yeah. So I work internationally with very fine people, the leaders in technology in this field. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this, uh, this is, <laughs> my team made this for me. They, <laughs> they my old artillery experience. So, I don't know if you can see that. Last year they gave me this. That's fantastic. Isn't that nice? Yes. It's a cannon, nice. only I can't shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, but you need very tiny little balls. To right. Play. That's right. And I don't. We are now sitting in your office. That's correct. But as we approached, I noticed that this was a very big building. Yes. So what happens with the rest of the building? The rest of the building, I mean... Yes. Business is not good. We're in a recession. Mm -hmm. So a good honk is empty. But we are doing uh, machines in the pharmaceutical area now. We're making a very nice uh, system It's going into Hungary. We've put about five or six of these systems in the U.S. We have a very good uh, customer who's a big company. Uh, so it makes a pharmaceutical product. We do things in the casting area mm -hmm. for investment casting. We do things in the meat area 
or industrial processing and cooking of meats. Uh, we do things in the, in the medical area for studying of brain chemistry. That's uh, very interesting, all sorts of microwaves you see <clears throat> are electronic. Mm -hmm. Let's let's look at let's look at <laughs> the business stinks. Let's <laughs> start out like that right now. Okay. But <clears throat> let's look at excuse the language. Let's look at where the U.S. is going. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Energy is scarce. Oil is expensive. Not only that, we just don't con control it. Oil. A lot of it comes from the from the Far East. The future source of energy is electrical energy. Mm -hmm. The most logical type of electrical energy will be nuclear. nuclear. Uh, but you can get electrical energy from solar cells and mm -hmm. from the wind and all things like that. If it's electrical, then you want to process and heat things with the means that are driven not by oil or coal, but by electricity, microwaves. Mm -hmm. So the future looks great for that. It's just that uh, the future is in the future. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. And uh, I don't know whether I have that much time. But meanwhile, a wonderful thing happened to me. My, my son, who's a very bright uh, engineer, uh, is working here now. That's wonderful. Yeah, he just started a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So he will grow. Let's hope he has good success in it. He's much smarter than I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when I, when I said to him, I said, Matt, <clears throat> all these years you're working at Reader's Digest. He's, he's a computer person. He's involved in information technology. I said, how come I've always wanted you to work here, and you know that. Why, why, why didn't you? over all those years. And he says to me, I didn't think I was good enough. Oh my. Isn't that something? That's very touching. Oh yeah, and he is good. He's better than I am. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think many parents would like to be able to turn their business that they've worked very hard over to, to yeah. um, a family member yeah. and very often that just doesn't work out. 39 years old. You have a nice girl. You should me. Oh, I'll work on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, Bernie, you have some unusual hobbies. Mm -hmm. um, can yes. you tell us about that? Well, I have. <coughs> I love I love nature in the outdoors. In the springtime and through the summer, I fly fish mm -hmm. when I can. And I've taught Susan to fly fish, and it's very, very technical. Uh, she's very good with her hands, knots, knitting, all of those things. Uh -huh. she makes these little flies, and she catches fish. We stand in the, in the water up to here in the mm -hmm. rivers, <coughs> and we try with these flies to catch fish. It's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. We'll travel at different places. Susan's gone as far as New Zealand, mm -hmm. right? So. But the summer ends like it is right. now, and the fall starts. In the fall, I focus on my dog, although I love my dog all the time. It's an outstanding bird dog. Yesterday I went bird hunting, and we got pheasant and uh, quail, and that dog is absolutely ins sensational. He finds them. All I have to do is shoot him, but that's who's in, cleans mm -hmm. him and cooks him. Wow. Wow. I, ha I have a, an interesting question for you. Yes. When you uh, uh, catch your fish or, or the pheasant, yeah. uh, who dresses it? Who dresses it? Yes. Susan dresses the fish. Uh-huh. <coughs> I, um, I clean the birds. Mm -hmm. That's yucky. She doesn't. But a surprising thing was, on our property at, on Westover Road, you can't shoot, of course, 
but you could bow hunt. There's so many deer. I, I killed deer, several of them, with a bow. Susan helped clean that. Mm -hmm. Not only that, she helped schlep it out of the woods with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got pictures of her, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> the way I gutted it and cleaned it and hung it up. Of course, a butcher's going to do the whole thing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But to bring it to the butcher, it was not neat enough mm -hmm. for her. So she spent a couple of hours just trimming and doing all that mm -hmm. stuff. She's all right. She tolerates all my <laughs> junk. <laughs> say say again. I'm sorry. I'm she to tolerates all my junk. <laughs> yeah, but and participates. How did you get involved in this hobby? I don't really know. It just sort of. <clears throat> I uh, I was not great at competitive sports. Mm -hmm. So your tennis game isn't terrific. Oh, my tennis is okay. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, yes, I do. I'm a tennis player, but as a as a child growing up, I was not good at competitive sports, and I and I always got beat up. And the last one to be picked, maybe it was being Jewish, as you said, but I don't know. I can relate to that. Right. <laughs> right. So I started doing individual things. Mm -hmm. Now you remember I told you I met my first wife, Deborah. Horseback riding. Horseback riding. So I rode horses like I'm a sugar. <laughs> right. And uh, and I got involved in the kind of activities that I can totally control myself. Mm -hmm. Fly fishing. Bird hunting. Mm -hmm. And I guess all and your... dog training. And dog training. Well, yes. I did, yeah. You have to train. train the dog. He just, he doesn't, I read the books and apply it to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got the instinct though. You got to get the one that has the instinct. Right. The instinct is one that he <coughs> that he'll point. So when when I go into a field like yesterday, I just give him a couple beeps on the whistle. He'll check out the whole field and all of a sudden, <coughs> oh my! He'll point, and I go down there and I kick around in the bushes and out it flies. So he and go and he'll bring it back to me. He's he's the main thing. Uh -huh. I, I don't really care about killing things, I, you know, I care about the dog being outstanding. That's wonderful. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bernie, I want to thank you so much for doing this interview. Okay. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure for me. I was a little nervous in the beginning. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I, say, I say, um, um, you know, when I, I give lectures, uh -huh. At times, and people say, you say, um, um, a lot. <laughs> um is a means of just continuing without having a word in your, right. in your head. <laughs> it's so keep, good. Keeping your place. <laughs> keeping your place. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. Uh, Bernie, do you want to tell us about this fish and <clears throat> right. you caught it? Right. I told you about fly fishing. This, this fish is a salmon. And I caught it in a, a river and up in New York State on a fly. The line is very, very thin, and it is a big fighting fish, and you just can't pull it in. You have to gradually get it in if you're going to catch it, and you have to run along the shore while the fish gets tired. So you run around the, along the river, over the rocks, and I finally got him in. Uh, and, what yeah, did he weigh? I think he weighed about 30 pounds or something. Really? Maybe it's something on there. I went with a friend of mine who was a microwave scientist, Bob Schiffman. He's a great friend, still very active microwave expert today and consultant. <coughs> ah, I told you about dogs? Yes. Um, right. <laughs> and one of your dogs. Right. Recently died. One, right. Yes. Tell us. Sure they both died. Tell us about your dogs, Bernie. Well, I have uh, the one on the right mm -hmm. is Jake. Jacob. Uh, <laughs> I have my current dog uh -huh. is Esau. Oh dear. So I have this, uh, Jacob and Esau. They they were both <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but Jake died. The other one is Sam. Sam never made it. The the, the white one. He looked pretty. But it was not a good bird dog. No. 
And you didn't ask me about my grandchildren. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. Tell us about these two beautiful children on your wall here. Okay. One is Jacob. Uh, he's now seven. Uh -huh. And Daniela is four. Uh, they are the, the, the children of Susan's oldest daughter, Leora. And they're just wonderful. They live not that far away. They live in Westchester County. Mm -hmm. And you have a new uh, grandchild, too. And I have a new grandchild from Susan's youngest daughter, mm -hmm. right? But Molly. very, very young. I, right. I, I can't commit to the International Microwave Power Institute. That's a good one. This is uh, the Jewish son that gave me that. Oh, you can see the black. That's uh, that's a team with Cobra. Before, before we cut back a bit, and that's a machine, a microwave machine. We broke a bottle of champagne on it. You could see it there. It's in South Africa now. Oh, oh. 